a blessing for you as it has been for me. Just to see the life of our Lord from the beginning, now getting close to the very end of his earthly ministry. The title of the message this morning was, is this. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. Did you hear that? When he was on the cross, you, take it personally, you were on his mind. Many years ago, that great pastor from Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. R.G. Lee, was visiting Jerusalem for the very first time. And when he and his group were entering the garden of the, the tomb where the skull hill can be seen, Dr. Lee took off running and and broke away from the group and ran ahead of them and where he could see the face of the skull in the rock. And when the guide and the rest of the group got there to him and they caught up with him, Dr. R.G. Lee was on his knees praying. And the guide asked him, he said, Dr. Lee, have you been here before? And Dr. Lee looked up at his guide because he's on his knees. And he looked up at his guy's guy with tears in his eyes and he said, yes, I was 2,000 years ago because I was on the heart and in the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ when he died for me. The book of the Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 8, the word tells us from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the lamb who has been slain. Ephesians 1 and verse 4, we hear these words, just as he chose us in him, listen, before the foundation of the world, that he would be holy and blameless before him in love. Beloved, listen, he chose you, he chose me before the foundation of the earth, that we would become his children. Isn't that a great thought? So you know what that tells me? That tells me that yes, when Jesus Christ was on that cross of Calvary, that he was thinking of you. He was thinking of me. We all know that more books have been written about, about the subject of Jesus Christ than any other person in history. And there are more books written about his death than on any other aspect of his life. Now I know and you know that there are enemies out there of the faith who they laugh at the idea that the, the, the Son of God would end up dying, dying a death of a common criminal. Yet this is the cross that makes the story of the Lord so real in the world where there is pain and suffering. As I was preparing this message, I thought to myself, I thought, Valley, if you only had one more sermon to preach before the Lord returned, what would it be on? What would it be on? And I came to the conclusion after seeking the Lord, I thought it would be on the cross of Jesus Christ and what went on there and why he went there. The Apostle Paul wrote to the, first, uh, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, this, he said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, the great apostle Paul, he said, All I want to know, all I want to understand is nothing more than Jesus Christ and him crucified on that cross. Instead of talking this morning about the actual brutality of the crucifixion. I'm going to circle around in several directions and answer the question that could be posed this morning, what really happened on the cross? What really happened on the cross? And there's thousands of answers to that question, but this morning I want to suggest four important things that happened when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Number one, when the soldiers crucified the Lord, they were fulfilling prophecy. Did you know that? When the soldiers who crucified the Lord, what they were doing was they were fulfilling prophecy. 
And I believe, to me, the fulfillment of prophecy is one of the strongest arguments for the supernatural nature of the Bible. It is supernatural, amen? Because a supernatural God wrote it. There are over 70 Old Testament prophecies about the Jewish Messiah and Jesus of Nazareth. And he filled every single one of them about his first coming. And he's going to fulfill every single one of them about his rapture. And he's going to fulfill every single one of them about his second coming one day because one day he will come. Amen? There's, someone said there's about 25 prophecies about the Lord's suffering and his death. And beloved, he fulfilled every single one of them. In the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 22, verse 14 says, I am poured out like, a, like water and all my bones are out of joints. Notice it doesn't say they were broken. They're just out of joint. Verse 16 of Psalm 22 says, A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hand, hands and my feet. Verse 18 says this, They divided my garment among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. These soldiers were not reading a copy of Psalm 22 and saying, oh, hey, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pierce his hands. We're going to pierce his feet. And oh, by the way, just to do this, we're going to throw lots for his garments. They didn't do that. They were doing their job. But in the same sense that they were doing their job, beloved, they were fulfilling biblical prophecy about Messiah. Prophecy is important to study. Prophecy is important for a pastor to preach about. And I really get a little, may I use the term frustrated, when my pastor brothers do not preach on prophecy. Because someone told me that a third of the Bible is nothing but prophecy. Now that's a lot, isn't it? And if it's that important to Almighty God, then, beloved, it ought to be important to us. The Lord died as a Passover lamb, and the instruction in Exodus was made clear that not one bone of the Passover lamb was, was to be broken. The Word of God tells us that when the soldiers came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not have to break his legs like they normally did. See, because when you're on the cross, what you would do, what a person would do is they would use their leg muscles and their legs and push themselves up, off, up like this so they could breathe in deep and get that lung full of air. And then they'd slide back down and they'd hold it as long as they could and then they'd expel it. And then they'd push themselves back up and get another big grasp of air. Well, if it was getting toward evening and they didn't want to get into the Sabbath, what the soldiers would do is they would come in and break their legs. That way they couldn't raise up and they would suffocate quicker. That's kind of horrible, isn't it? But see, when those soldiers got to Jesus, he was already dead. They didn't know that they were fulfilling Scripture prophecy. The, and the amazing thing about these Old Testament prophecies is that they were penned 2,000 years before the Roman soldiers and the Roman government started using crucifixion as a method of execution. Number two, when God turned his face away, darkness covered the land. When God turned his face away, darkness covered the land. The Lord was nailed to the cross about 9 a.m. in the morning. And for the first three hours, there's a lot of activity. People, we read it earlier, people are passing by. They're shouting their heads. They're shouting all kinds of derogatory things at him. They're even wagging, the scripture says that they're wagging their heads at him. Making fun of him. Laughing at him. The Lord made several statements from the cross. One, he cried out, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. 
What a statement. Not only did he say that, but he asked John the Beloved to take care of Mary, his mother. But at noon, something amazing happened. Now put yourself there. I'm always telling you that, aren't I? Put yourself there. You're on the mount. You're at Golgotha. There's two crosses, one with a thief on each one. And there in the middle is Yeshua, Jesus the Nazarene. You are in Jerusalem, the Middle East. It's hot. It's daytime. The sun is shining brightly down upon you. It's noon. And I'm sure that all the taunting and jeering grew quiet and stopped altogether, mainly out of fear. And imagine yourself standing there outdoors at noon and suddenly, you ready? Darkness. Darkness. The Word of God says that darkness covered the entire land. And for three hours there was a supernatural darkness that developed the land. Now, beloved, it wasn't a dust storm or it wasn't a thunderstorm that some people try to, try to come up with and try to convince themselves. And by trying to convince themselves, they try to convince us that it was just a dust storm, it was just a thunderstorm. And let me tell you something else. It was not a solar eclipse. Because any solar eclipse that I've ever seen, they only last for a few minutes. They've never lasted for three hours. This was a supernatural darkness. And you know that shouldn't surprise us, should it? Think of this. Just as there was a supernatural light in the sky at the birth of Jesus Christ to guide the Magi to where he was at, there was a supernatural darkness at his death. Why? Because God is the creator and he's sovereign over nature. And it listens to him. We don't have to wonder why there was darkness. Our Lord cried out, My God, my God, why have, they, why have you forsaken me? The cry there was the reason for the darkness. And the darkness was the reason for the cry. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13 says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you, you can not look on wickedness with favor. Then over in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 7 and 8, we read these words, For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you in an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you. For a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. From the beginning of the beginning, God the Son and God the Father had been co-equal and co-eternal. But in that moment, in that time in which the humanity of Jesus Christ took on, listen, you ready? He took on your sins in my sins, God the Father in heaven turned and looked away. When God the Father looked away from his sin-stained son, darkness descended. Isaac Watts was a prolific hymn writer. We have him, his songs in our hymn book. He was a hymn writer of the 17th century, and one of, the, one of his most famous hymns was the one that we just sung called, and it was about the cross. He wrote this, and let me read it to you. It says, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Now, this is what Isaac Watts wrote, not what new style, politically correct people rewrote. Did not my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? 
Now, Isaac Watts took that from the 22nd Psalm where King David was convicted of his sinfulness and King David himself called himself a worm. And Isaac Watts used it in, within that song. Number three, when the Lord died, he took the punishment I deserve. He took the punishment you deserve. When the Lord was on the cross, you and I were on his mind. We were in his heart because he was taking our punishment. And we believe in a very powerful doctrine and it has a big name to it, this doctrine does. It's called substantiatory, uh, substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement. What that means was that the Lord took our place. He was a substitute for us on that cross for dying for our sins. Isaiah the prophet pro prophesied the Messiah would take our, our punishment. Listen to what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on him. Isaiah the prophet wrote that of Jesus many years before Jesus was born on this earth. There's a church in Norway where a figure of a lamb has been carved high up on the tower of the church. And there's a fascinating story behind it and about that carving I'd like to share with you this morning. When the church was under construction many years ago, the workmen, they were up on their scaffolding and they were working away and they were working on the tower and one of the workmen lost his balance and fell screaming toward the pavement many feet below. His fellow workers climbed down as fast as they could expecting to find him dead there on the pavement but to their amazement and their, their astonishment and their joy, he was alive and walking with only a few single injuries. At the moment of his, fell, of his fall, a flock of, of sheep were passing through that narrow street underneath the tower. And it just so happened that the workman fell and he landed on, one, on top of one of the poor sheep, crushing and killing the sheep instantly. But it broke the workman's fall and he survived. So in memory of, of this miraculous deliverance, the workman carved a, a, a lamb on the tower at the exact height where he fell. Now that's a powerful image, isn't it? But it applies to you and I as fallen men and fallen women that the Lord Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, that at his death the Lord broke our fall and now we can walk away forgiven and whole. What a blessing. Number four, when the curtain tore, it opened a new way to God. Now let's remember back. Let's go back in history, Jewish history. Are you there? About 300 yards from Golgotha stood the Jewish temple. Inside the temple, there were two rooms. The first room was the holy place. That was where a few priests performed daily services and daily sacrifices. But an inner room was called the Holy of Holies. There, the Jewish people believed that God's glory dwelt. And only a only the high priest was allowed to enter into that room. Separating these two rooms, effectively separating God's glory from the rest of the world, was a thick curtain. It was 60 feet tall and 30 feet wide. It was woven as thick, some say, as a man's hand. 
And at the moment that the Lord Jesus Christ died on that cross, that curtain was ripped in two, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. See, it could be explained away if it was ripped from bottom to top, couldn't it? Well, yeah, maybe so many men grabbed this side and so many men grabbed this side and they just pulled and they ripped it. It didn't happen that way. It was ripped, torn from top to bottom. That curtain that basically separated God from the, from the world and God's presence can only be accessed through the mediation of the high priest. But when the Lord died, a new way to God was open. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at verse, starting in verse 19. We'll read 19 through 22. Hebrews 10. Cha uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in the full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The torn curtain has, to me, three amazing consequences for us. Number one, it means no more barriers. Praise God. Amen? The Jewish temple had a series of barriers or walls. If you were not a Jewish person, you could only go to the court of the Gentiles and you had to stop there. You were not allowed any further. If you were a Jewish woman, you had to stop before you came to the court of the men because you were a Jewish woman. Another barrier, another wall. If you were not a priest, you couldn't enter into the court of the priest. Only a few priests were allowed to enter the holy place, which was, was the room outside the holy of holies. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Jewish high priest would lift the corner of this massive blue curtain and slip into the holy place, or holy of holies, with fear and trembling. Because he knew that he was going in to where they believed that the presence of God resided. And once inside, he would take the blood of the Lamb and sprinkle it on the seat of the Ark of the Covenant. He was there as a representative of the whole Jewish people to seek forgiveness on their behalf. But when Jesus died on the cross, this curtain was torn. God was saying, there will no longer be any barriers between you and me. Amen. No more barriers. And God did that himself. Now, you and I can approach God freely through the blood of Jesus Christ. When I go to my God in prayer, I always start it out, and some people might say, well, Valley, it's so repetitious. No, it's from my heart. Because I go to God and I say, God, I know I'm coming before your throne. I know I'm walking into the Holy of Holies because I'm walking into your presence and I do it from no merits of what I could have done, what I have done. I'm doing this all on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross and the shedding of his blood. And the word of God, your word, God, says that I have the privilege of doing this. And here, my Father, is my thanksgivings. Here's my desires. Here's my prayers. Your will be done. That's how we go before the Lord. Amen. The other things it means is this. No more sacrifices. No more sacrifices. The Jewish priests had slay, would slay thousands of bulls and lambs and goats in the temple area. 
And on, on this very mountain, a, literally a virtual river of blood had flown down the slopes to seek forgiveness for the sins of the people. And as the Lord died as the Lamb of God, there is no need for any animal sacrifices. Let me ask you a question this morning. You may think it's lighthearted. It may even sound lighthearted. But think of what we've just been talking about. Aren't you glad you didn't have to bring a lamb or a goat to church this morning? That we would sacrifice for your forgiveness. Every family bring their lamb, bring their goat. And as pastor of the church, I would be up here more than likely covered in blood, slitting its throat, sprinkling blood on the seat of the Ark of the Covenant, turning my back to you, asking God to forgive you. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that? I praise God for that. The Lamb of God has already made the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Number three, no more mediators. No more mediators. The average Jewish person could never enter the holy place, let alone the holy of holies. They needed a priest to do that for them. But when the curtain was torn, God was telling us, we don't need anyone else to be our mediator. Listen, I love to pray for you, and I do pray for you, and I pray for, uh, for the people on, my, on the prayer list. I love praying for you. I love praying with you. But I don't have to. It's a joy for me. It's an honor for me. But I don't have to. Because of your relationship with Almighty God through the blood of Jesus Christ, that gives you the, the freedom, it gives you the the blessing that you can go to before Almighty God yourself. You don't need me to pray for you. Now, I want to, but you don't need me to. You don't need me to go before Almighty God and call your name out and say, Oh, God, please forgive whoever for this sin that they have committed. And then I come back to you and say, Okay, I prayed. God has forgiven you. You sin, I sin. We go straight to one person, one mediator, the man Jesus Christ, and say, God, I blew it. I sinned. Will you please forgive me? And as a child is his, he'll always say, yes, I do. We don't need a mediator anymore. We don't need anyone as that mediator between us except the Lord Jesus Christ. The curtain was torn open so we can approach God on our own because of our relationship with Him. We don't need to confess our sins to anyone except Jesus. He is our high priest. And through Him and Him alone, we have access to the Creator God of this universe. Isn't that a blessing? Stop for a second and think of that. You... Don't think of your spouse. Don't think of the person in front of you, behind you, to your right, to your left. Think of yourself. And I'm doing the same thing. We, as his children, as born from above believers, we have the access to go straight to holy God, the creator of this universe. Now, if that's not a blessing, nothing is. Here's what the word of God says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. There is one God. How many gods? One God. And one mediator also between God and men. Now that word men means mankind. The man, Jesus Christ. No one else. No one else. That is the word of God, beloved. That's not me saying that. That's Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. God is saying, as the authority, and you remember 2 Timothy 3.16, for all scripture is inspired by God. 
God said, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, He said, there is, there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Remember last week I we talked about periods instead of question marks? There's a period right here. There's a period right here. Now let me leave you with this. You and I were on his mind when he died. We were there. We were there. The Dutch artist Rembrandt was a very deeply committed Christian man. He didn't paint, uh, preach the Bible, he painted the Bible. Okay? In the main art museum in Munich, Germany, you can see one of his masterpieces called The Rising of the Cross. And again, as was Rembrandt's style, he painted himself into the scene. He is the man, if you see that picture, he is the man with the beret helping to raise the cross. It is his way of saying that he was there at the cross when Jesus died there so many years before. You and I may not be a Rembrandt. You may be like me and have troubles drawing stick figures. But I'll tell you what, even in our crude drawing of stick figures, and if you draw the cross and the cross being raised up, you could put yourself and I could put myself there. Because when Jesus went on the cross, he had me and you on his heart and in his mind. The old song that we sung earlier, a very wonderful song. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The song goes on in saying, it says, sometimes... It causes me to tremble. It doesn't stop there. It says tremble. Tremble. Beloved, yes, you and I were there when he was on the cross. We were in his heart and in his mind. For God so loved the world that's me and you, that he gave his only begotten son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. Father God, I pray today that you speak to hearts. That, Father, as Christians, we will remember what you've done and what, what happened there at the cross. And we will praise you for it. And thank you for our relationship with you. Father God, what an honor, what a privilege it is that we can now go before you and we don't need anyone else to do that. All because of a relationship with you. Because at one time we asked that you would forgive us of our sins and that you would have the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and take control of our lives, the third part of the Trinity. And that you would be our Lord and our Savior. And that we would be your slave. And your word says that when we do that, you have guaranteed us that that is what you will do. So as believers, Father God, we say thank Thank you that you came into our lives on that day, that night, that evening. For those that are hearing this message and they don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray today, Father God, that today they will look up to you and ask you to forgive them of their sins. And that you will have the Holy Spirit to come into their lives and take control of their lives. And that you will become their Lord and their Savior. 
meaning that they will be your slave and that they will serve you. But because of this faith in you, by them confessing their sins and repenting and inviting you into their lives, their names shall be written in the Lamb's Book of Life for all eternity. And there's no more barriers. There's no more sacrifices. There's no more mediators that they, along with us, can come before you on the merits of Jesus Christ and Him alone and bring our prayers and petition before you. Father, I pray as we sing this song of invitation, maybe for the first time, maybe we need to just say thank you, God, for doing that. Maybe it needs to be a time of recommitment of saying, God, I haven't been walking with you faithfully, knowing full well what you've done for me, and I need to recommit my walk to you. As we sing this song, Father God, lead us and guide us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with us, please, and take your hymnal and turn to page 309. 309. And we're going to sing this song, Lord, I'm coming home. Wouldn't it be great if today would be the day that he would say, it's over. I'm rapturing my people. I'm taking them to heaven. We could say, Lord, I'm coming home. Let's sing.